I'm Dr. Dina Kurzweil. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Medicine and director of the Education and Technology Innovation Support Office. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Lynette Hamlin, Dr. Linda McCauley, and Dr. Karen, she goes by Beth Marcellus, who will be joining us today to talk about these topics. Thanks, Dr. Kurzweil. Okay, well, I will let folks read the objectives here for themselves and talk a little bit about the origin of this session. So uh, you may be wondering why we're talking about multiple choice questions in teaching with technology. And uh, Dr. McCauley, who we'll be talking a little bit later, is uh, someone many of you may be familiar with. She does a lot of the Canvas training, and she's been doing some Canvas training on assessment and the quiz tool in Canvas. And she ended up getting a lot of questions, not necessarily just about the Canvas tool, but actually about writing effective um, questions to put into that tool. So that led us to decide to do a teaching with technology session specifically about writing effective uh, multiple choice questions, since that's what you're generally going to be using in your uh, Canvas assessment. Before we dig into some of the micro on writing effective test questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about aligning it with the goals of assessments in our courses. A little bit kind of not kind of about test blueprints. So, you know, when we do our assessments, what do we want our students to know when they leave this course? So aligning the objectives for each exam or assessment with both the course objectives and the class objectives for those classes that you are going to do your assessment on. And then once you look at your learning objectives, what kind of assessments are you going to do? So how can you line up your assessments that will tell us as faculty that students have achieved those learning objectives that you've identified in your course and class objectives? Giving some pre-thought to this for your assessment helps us ensure as faculty that our teaching learning goals and the assessment practices we use in our classes are clear to our students so that they know what to focus on as we present the content and what they're going to need to, excuse me, know and learn as they demonstrate their learning. So one of the first pieces of that is what our learning objectives are and what level. And you'll see some of this is looking familiar. So if we're asking our students to recall, recognize, or identify information, objective test items are good types of assessments to meet those learning objectives and different types between multiple choice can be fill in the blank, matching, and labeling. So it helps them recall terms, facts, and concepts. If we're asking our students to interpret, exemplify, classify, summarize, infer, compare, or explain activities such as exams that require students to summarize the content, compare and contrast, classify or categorize, paraphrase, find examples. For me as the clinician asking students to apply their learning into clinical scenarios is one type of piece that I've been using. Thank you. Okay, thanks Dr. Hamlin. So now let's take a look. Um, Dr. Hamlin kind of talked to you about a couple of different uh, types of things you can do with an exam. And I wanted to take a look at the anatomy of multiple choice questions so that we can all make sure we're on the same page, just in terms of terminology and what I'll be talking about today during the session. So you can see an actual multiple choice question here on the page. And you can see there's a couple of different parts that I've highlighted. So the first box is a vignette. And that's that's where not every question is going to have one, but that's where you'll give the background and the case study and the uh, any kind of information that the students might need for these kinds of higher order questions. 
If all you're asking is recall, you may you probably don't need that. You'll, you'll just have this second box, the leading question, stem, those types of things. So uh, those are two of the parts of the question. And then you also, of course, have to have answer choices. That's important for the students. Um, but also you should think about the fact that your student should really be able to answer the question even without seeing the answer choices. And by that, I mean, you wanna make sure you're actually asking them a question that has a clear, a clear question with a clear answer. So if, you can, if they can look at that question and at least have in their mind, oh, the answer to this is X or at the minimum, oh, the answer to that is a body part. I don't know what it is, but I can tell that that's what it should be. That's how you know you're, you're on the path to a good question or, or if you can't do that, you're certainly on the path to a bad question. Um, so before you even get to the answer choices, you'll, you'll have a clue as to whether it's a good or a bad question. Um, but again, you have a list of options and answer choices. And then, so you'll have a correct answer, which you have here highlighted in red. And then you have some distractors or incorrect answer choices, which you see here highlighted, uh, which are not highlighted in red, they're just black. And you can see the distractors identifying them. Now, um, as you look at this, you can think about, as we, and we, as we start to think about writing good effective assessment questions, multiple choice questions, if you think about it, there's really kind of two ways that the writing of these types of questions can make them ineffective. First off, if people can easily answer the question correctly, even if they don't know the answer, that is a poorly written question. Or if people who do actually know the answer are unable to answer the question correctly because of the way it's written, that is also a problematic question. So I'll be talking today a little bit about some of the things you can do to try to make sure that you don't have either of these problems with your questions. Again, questions should be designed so that students who know the material can find the correct answer. Um, so again, I'd advocate avoiding trick questions, you know, questions that are designed to lead students to an incorrect answer. That's, that's really kind of defeating the purpose of the exam. You really want to know in the question, you want to know that students can show you what they know. Uh, and trick questions are really kind of just, you know, making sure they can read the question correctly or, or there's, there's something else going on with those. So we want to avoid those in, uh, in good exams. Um, so first, moving to talk a little bit about some things, characteristics of a good uh, vignette for an assessment question. The important thing here is that you give in your vignette only the facts needed to answer the question. And that's going to depend on the type of question it is, obviously. It is sort of a, a case-based question. There's a lot of information that could be in there, but you really want to pare it down to what they need to answer the question correctly. Um, so only the needed facts. If there's clinical data, you want to include units so you don't get them confused. Is this, you know, um, you know, liters, milliliters? There's going to be, you know, uh, there's going to be a, a, a big difference. Obviously, you're probably not using liters, but um, different different units are. It's going to make a difference in their answer. Um, you may need physical findings. You may need results of diagnostic test. Um, all these are going to help the students get focused on the right answer. Another thing to keep them focused uh, is you don't want to use names. Generally, there's not really a need to use names in the question, um, unless it's some sort of a dialogue where you want to show a doctor and the patient speaking, um, because names can be a distraction. They may make people think about the person rather than the, the question or condition that you're talking about. So try to keep it uh, as generic as possible. Certainly don't use a real patient name with real patient details. Um, but again, not using a name. Um, and even gender, race, those may be things that will affect the answer choice. If they are, you can include them. But if not, you want to leave those out. Because again, those are going to distract people, make them think either differently about the, differently about the, the question itself. If it's not relevant, you shouldn't include it. Um, OK, so now let's take a look at some things that can help you write a good question or STEM. Uh, so first, as I said before, make sure it's a question. If it's just something like uh, something more abstract, like, you know, what do you think or, uh, or you know, what's, what's going on here, that's a little bit vague. So you want to be as specific as possible. And also, uh, especially now, as we're talking, all of our students are, are advanced level students. 
Um, you want to keep focused on, on really higher order questions. You don't want to use true false questions at this level um, for a couple of reasons. First off, because they have a 50-50 chance of getting it right, even if they don't know the answer. So that's always problematic. Um, but even so, when you write a true false question, you have an answer, a specific answer in mind, but your readers may or may not have, you know, the background knowledge, or they, not, they may not know what you know, they may not really be thinking in the same line you're thinking. So they really kind of have to guess what you had in mind. Um, and so that's really going to cause problems. Um, so you really want to try to avoid something like a true false question because there's too, too much uh, vagueness in it. So multiple choices are really helpful because you have clear, generally defined answers. Um, also, you want to avoid imprecise terms in your question, like usually, generally, in the question you see here, even most likely might be a little bit in, imprecise, because again, different people may, mean, may have different ideas of what that means. So that's going to affect in the question, if you have this imprecise term, that may affect the student thinking about the answer. Uh, so you want to avoid that. Um, also, avoid negatively phrased items. So you don't want to say, you know, which of the following muscles is not most likely to have been injured uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first off, if especially if most of your questions are not phrased that way, if you throw in one that's phrased with a not, students are likely to overlook it, right? So you don't want to throw them off. It's going to make it easy for them to miss the question simply because they didn't see that key question, that key part of the answer. So instead, you'll want to try to rewrite the question so that it's a positive choice rather than a negative choice. So yeah, so if you do use a not, if you do use not in your answer in your question, you absolutely need to highlight it, make it big, bold, red, uh, but you really want to avoid it if at all possible. So answer choices. Let's take a look at what you can do to make effective answer choices. Uh, first off, one of the there's uh, different schools of thought about how to order your answer choices. But one of the one of the rules I learned that I've always followed is you want to list them in alphabetical or numerical order, depending on the type of question. Uh, for a couple of reasons, the biggest reason is then the students. You know, we talked about whether students can figure out the correct answer even if they don't know it, and if, they're, if the answer choices are not in alphabetical order, then students might be trying to look at that to see whether that's giving them an answer choice. And I know before I learned this rule, if I was writing a multiple choice test, I would sit there and say, oh, wait, the last three answer choices were C, so I need to make sure this answer choice is D because I've had too many Cs in a row, and I would, I would reorder the answer choices based on that. If you use something, if you use multiple choice or numerical choice for numerical, or uh, sorry, if you use um, alphabetical order or numerical order for numerical questions, then students will notice, okay, everything's in alphabetical order. I can disregard the order of the answer choices because that's not going to give me any information at all. So it really helps you. So that's one less thing you have to worry about. Um, also, ensure that there is, as I said before, only one correct answer uh, so that the students know exactly what they should select. Um, you want to avoid overlapping choices, which may happen in a couple of ways. In numbers, you might you don't want to say one to five and five to ten because then if the answer is five, they don't know which to choose. Um, you know, any overlapping number sets will will cause problems. Uh, it can also be a problem, for example, in anatomy if you have anatomical structures with larger structures that contain smaller structures, and then what if you're you know if you're mixing different types of things. Um, and one structure is included in another, that's, that can cause problems. So definitely make sure that you have one um, clear, uh, clear answer each time and that the answers do not overlap. And then uh, you want to avoid including uh, terms like always or never in your answer choice, especially if it's only in some of them. Students will immediately discount those because it's, it's rare that you're going to have something that's that definitive. This is, you know, this is, this is always going to be a diagnosis of X because whatever, or, you know, students just disregard that. Um, they realize that there, it's less likely to be true than anything that doesn't have that kind of absolute term. 
Also, uh, you want to avoid all above the above or none of the above questions. Again, for a couple of reasons. The, the biggest one is that if you have an all of the above answer choice, and depending on how many answer choices you have, you may have a lot, you may have a few, but if students see more than one answer that they know is correct, no matter how many answer choices you have, if you have all of the above, they know that that must be the answer. So they don't, they don't even need to go through the process of, of looking at the answer choices. So you don't wanna do that. You wanna make sure they're considering everything. Um, and similarly, if it's a none of the above question and they see uh, one that they know is false and that's they see two that they know are false, then they know that none of the above is the correct answer as well. So. All of the above and none of the above allow students to who don't have a full knowledge uh, to select which, uh, based on partial knowledge, they can sometimes get the correct answer. So again, that means they didn't they didn't necessarily know the right answer; they just guessed it, and that's a, that's an ineffective question. Um, and again, none of the above actually turns it into a kind of a true false a true false test. So a series of true false questions. Though we already said we don't want to do that. All right, so a big question that comes up when we're writing multiple choice uh, questions is, how many answer choices do I need for a multiple choice question? And to show this, I wanted to, to do a question that I personally wrote. Um, so you'll see it's not really a, a higher order question because um, I am not a medical professional, um, healthcare professional. Uh, so I wrote a question just to kind of show you what happens when you start um, writing too many multiple choice answer choices. So here's a few, they look like they might be reasonable. And then suddenly, whoa, I got to four and I could not figure out what to do. So I just uh, I just threw in Dracula. Now, um, you know, it looks like some of the other words. So, uh, so for, uh, for someone with my level of knowledge, it might actually, might actually work. But generally that's, that's not gonna be effective. In fact, uh, research suggests that three answer choices is sufficient. Um, there's uh, studies and literature reviews. The reference on this page is actually a lit review that, that studied a lot of different research on multiple choice questions. And there's no significant difference in terms of student uh, performance, whether there's three answer choices given or four answer choices or five answer choices. Uh, you don't need to feel like you should come up with five answer choices uh, or even four answer choices if they're not good answer choices, then it's not gonna distract the students and it's not really worth your time. So um, three answer choices is plenty as long as they're good ones. If you wanna do more, you can. Um, extra, extra credit, if anyone, uh, anyone knows the picture on the right, anyone know why we have that on here? Any, uh, any Monty Python fans in the chat? We've got a... Uh, this is actually the holy hand grenade, hand grenade of Antioch. If you've watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know the number of the answer choices should be three. Uh, you can actually go a little bit higher than three if you want, but, uh, but not fewer, because uh, that would make it a true false question. So uh, three answer choices is plenty. Uh, a couple more things to talk about with answer choices before I let you all attack some questions on your own. First off, Take a look at the question. Just go ahead and read through the question and read through the answer choices. And I'll talk a little bit about, um, about the question after I've given you a chance to read through it. All right. So as I said, I am not a healthcare professional, but even not being a healthcare professional, um, I can read this question and say the first step in management should be intravenous administration of. So I can discount A and C right off the top. Um, they're not grammatically consistent with the stem. So that's an important piece. People can discard answer choices if they're not grammatically consistent with the stem. Um, I might, if I knew a little bit more, know that some of these wouldn't be administered intravenously. Um, but still, the important thing is that they're, they're inconsistent uh, with the, the question itself. Also, uh, you want your answer choices to be homogeneous. So as you can see, um, some of these are procedures, some of these are, are tests, 
Uh, some of these are medications. So you want each answer choice to be sort of the same category so that you're not letting people discount again if they know if they know that the answer has to be something in some sort of thing like a medication and you've included answer choices that aren't medications then clearly that's going to be wrong so you've just uh, made it easier for them to get the the question correct without knowing the answer choice um so they want to be homogeneous they want to be similar in length um so these are all important things as you look at your answer choices these are not too bad in terms of similarity and length, um, but definitely the, the two medications at the end are a little bit longer, a little bit shorter than some of the others. Uh, so that that might let people give people some clues, the different answer lengths of answer choices. All right, let's take a look at another question. Um, this is a little bit longer, so I'll give you some time to read the question and the answer choices. Okay, now this one, um, it's not quite as obvious. So let me tell you the correct answer choice is D. And if you read through the question, you can see that there's, the, there's some information in the question about heating. So uh, as, again, an intelligent, uh, clever test taker could read through and say, well, I see heating in the question. I see heating in the, Answer choices, so I'm going to guess it's heating. This is this gives them a clue that um, that the answer choices gave them a clue because it, it reflects some of the answer in the question, some of the information in the question. So you want to make sure that your answer choices are not using similar language to the to what's in the question that might give the students the answer. And that's true even if you are using a different language, right? If you're using sort of Latin in the answer choices and it's in English in the question or vice versa, you know, your students are going to know enough to recognize the Latin roots and, and stems and things. So, you, so that, that doesn't necessarily get you out of it. Um, you want to make sure that your, your language in the answer choices don't mirror in any way the language of the questions in, in either, either language. So I want to move on now. I think I've given you most of the tips and I want to take a few minutes to go through a few examples. Um, so now um, folks can type into the chat. For the next few slides, I'm just going to put a question up and you all can type into the chat where uh, any comments you have about the question, answer choices. Uh, each of them should have at least one of the issues that I've uh, discussed in the course of the presentation. So go ahead and type in, type into the chat uh, what you see is wrong with this question. Looks like people have gotten it. So first off, it's it's not really a question. Good point. Um, and then the language in some of the answer choices, uh, C and D, you can see that people are going to discount that. Um, so you're down to three answer choices, which is fine. Um, not a not a terrible thing to have three answer choices, but you didn't. The person writing the question didn't really need to spend time on writing answer C and D because they know the students are going to write those out. Um, so yeah, good job. Um, let's take a look at another question. So take a quick, quick look at this question, the answer choices. Um, right, so you see the answer choice is none of the above. You don't want to do that. Dullness is used twice, so that can be confusing um, that people, uh, the, the answer choices aren't entirely distinct. So yes, yeah, so some of the language is a little unclear. Um, one other thing is that the, the first the first answer choice, this is a little bit more subtle, but the first answer choice has two different things, two different content items included, and the rest of them only have one. So that, that can throw people off a little bit as well. So, um, so yeah. All right, let's take a look at, uh, look at a couple more questions and then I'll let uh, Dr. McCauley take over for a minute. All right, example three. But, uh, what issues do you see with this question and the and or the answer choices? All right, let's see a few people 
And again, you can see just from these examples, it's really easy. And a lot of people do not do just omit the question itself, right? A lot of people will just sort of say, oh, people know what I mean, right? I have a statement and people know what the question is based on this statement, but that's not really, uh, that's not really effective. Your learners are really gonna be focused and they may not know what you're asking in that question. So um, if you don't put a, an actual question in, it's gonna just increase the cognitive load um, and make it harder for them to, uh, to use the exam to demonstrate their knowledge. It becomes more of a, a guessing game for them as to what exactly you're looking for. We've got some usuallys in here, right? So some vague language. And the other thing, just because I was an English major once upon a time, I always notice, um, I always notice the parallelism, right? Severe obesity in early adolescence, poor prognosis. That might be kind of a, a one of those uh, ratio type questions or the, um, but it's not an actual poor prognosis doesn't uh, grammatically follow like the rest of the things. Right, and 75% chance, uh, that's, that's a good point. Uh, the 75% chance seems very specific, right? So again, we talked a little bit about having the answer choices be similar. And that's sort of, you know, most of these are, are just verbal kind of talking about prognosis um, and things. And this is suddenly you're getting into percentages and, and, um, and something, you know, that makes this one pretty different than the others. So people are, are likely to, uh, to not get the answer, or, you know, that that's gonna look very different to them. And again, one of the things I found when I was looking for sample questions to use here, uh, since I don't know all the, the ins and outs and I wanted relevant uh, medical and uh, healthcare questions, uh, a lot of times they don't tell you what the correct answer choice is, the sources that I found. And so I don't actually know what the correct answer choice is for this one. Um, I just know that there's a lot of issues with the, the answer choices that are provided. Um, so we'll take a look at one more example. So for this one, um, right, choice C is not homogeneous, lack of specificity. So yeah, this one, the, the correct answer is actually B. I did someone, they did give me the correct answer for this one, um, which is interesting because um, I know from, you know, as we talked about, you want, uh, you want the answer choices to be similar and the correct answer is the only one in this case that's different from the rest. Um, so that's, you know, that's something to keep in mind as well. You're, you're, you wanna make sure that the answer choices have enough differences between them that people aren't gonna notice a difference that doesn't actually, they're gonna notice something is different, but it's not, it's not actually relevant. That's a problem. Um, so you wanna use that similar language as we've talked about. And also um, I've, I manipulated some of the answer choices a little bit from the original source. And uh, folks may or may not know, I just from looking at the, from research, uh, bowel sounds is a subset of lower pitched sounds. So that's, I think someone identified that lower pitched sounds was, was not particularly specific. So again, these aren't necessarily distinct answer choices. There's a lot of, a lot of kind of noise as it were going on in here that's going to uh, potentially throw some students off. So anyway, I'm sure we could, uh, we could go on all day with me putting, uh, putting questions up and uh, you all tearing them to shreds. And you're welcome to, uh, you're welcome to spend some time looking at your own exams now, now that you know some of the tips and, and tearing your own questions to shreds. Uh, but at this point, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. McCauley so she can talk a little bit about test security. So once you have uh, your perfectly written multiple choice questions, you also want to make sure that you consider test security in your test settings, if, particularly if you're using an online platform like our learning management system. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time to go over some of these uh, pieces of information, keeping in mind that we do have that session on September 1st at nine o'clock in the morning, which will go into a lot more detail than this, but this is your you know, 10,000 foot overview, uh, high level of the types of things you wanna think about. So definitely take a look at those quiz settings that you have in your learning management system. Look at things like shuffling your answers, adding a time limit, allowing multiple attempts or not, um, showing one question at a time or not. Um, 
because all of those things in concert with each other can add to your test security. Because if we shuffle the answers, then students sitting next to each other likely won't have the same test. If we put a time limit, they can't look up answers as easily. But I will uh, caution you, make sure that time limit is reasonable so that you're not testing their speed with which they can take a test instead of the content they're supposed to know. Also considering that multiple attempts, um, should they be able to do it more than once so they actually can show mastery or not? Um, and then really the most important one is the bullet point here that it says, let students see their quiz responses. In Canvas, it is checked by default. So that means whenever students take a quiz in Canvas, automatically they will see their quiz responses after they submit the quiz. So if you don't want that, I would recommend checking those quiz settings and leave that particular setting unchecked until after everyone takes the quiz and you're ready to review the answers. Then you can let them see uh, the responses. You also may want to use a question or item banks so that students are seeing different questions on their test. Specifically, if you're using multiple attempts, that's a good way to make sure each attempt is unique. Um, it also helps students sitting next to each other in the same room uh, not have the same test as well. You can use availability dates to make sure that the test is only visible when you want it to be visible. So during that testing window only, not before and not after. And you also want to consider potentially adding an honor statement as your first question on the test. You could actually put a statement that they have to respond to, um, that they are the person taking the test and they only are the only person taking the test. They did not receive any uh, assistance or something like that as they completed uh, the assessment. So that way you are more assured that uh, the work is their own. Thank you for watching today's Teaching with Technology Brown Bags session. You can view all Teaching with Technology Brown Bags on the USU YouTube channel under the full ETI playlist. Have a nice day.